Hey, Beth. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, folks, we're going to have a lot of fun today. I, I do feel it and I believe it. Uh, Beth has been on us with us once before. Uh, she's back in good part because this book, Awakening Humanity, has just been released this uh, September. Mm -hmm. and, and I had the opportunity to read it in advance. In fact, as I wound up writing the forward to the book, uh, Beth asked if I would write a little something for the back. I started, but it got too long. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to read the whole book and, and write a, a forward to it as well. This is very exciting stuff. Uh, let's talk a little bit about The Course in Miracles and The Course of Love, Choose Only Love, those sort of books. And, and before we get into best work, of course, you know that The Course in Miracles is like core central to my work and to much of the work we're doing here. Also, I have a deep appreciation for A Course of Love and now choose only love as well we had sebastian on with us last week we've got a really wonderful lineup of folks uh i've had both of these folks on this year and and i'm sure we'll be on again um what's interesting to me is that what the course of miracles does it provides us with a basic background of understanding the psychology of these minds of ours how we got into the mess that we're in metaphysically speaking, and how we can also get out of it by changing our minds, by removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, by beginning to see things differently. The course, I know many of you are deep into the course, the course works. It produces transformations in people's lives. These other books that I'm talking about also work. They provide deep transformations in our lives. One thing that they don't talk about is what might be beyond the dimensions of our own insanity, so to speak, and the way that we're trying to recover from sleeping. Of course, as we're still sleeping, it's called the sleep of forgetfulness, which is on our minds. So it's trying to help us to wake up. But at the same time that that's true, we're recognizing that we are part of a gigantic, uh, incomprehensibly large universe. Mm -hmm. There's a line in the Course in Miracles where it says that God is the father of the universe and of the universe of universes. Mm -hmm. What is the universe of universes? I was contemplating that question one day while I was standing at our kitchen sink, which is goes, there's a window right in front of the sink, and there's a little tiny black bug walking along that, that ceiling there. And I thought, well, that's a universe. That little black bug is a universe into itself. It's a universe within a universe. And of course, there are billions and trillions of those. But we're also talking about another way of opening up our minds. There's another very interesting line that appears the last line in Lesson 52 in A Course in Miracles, which says, Would I not rather join in the thinking of the universe? than to continue to cherish my own petty little thoughts. That's not quite, the, the second part's not quite right, but that's the idea. Would I not rather participate in the thinking? So there's a kind of thinking, if you will, which is the thinking of the universe of which we are a part. And Beth, who has been a student of the Course in Miracles for quite a long time herself, Beth and I share one thing in common, which is that we both grew up on ancestral farms in the Midwest, and she's still on her farm. And uh, I like to go back to ours whenever I can get a chance. It still is in our family. There's something about growing up in nature which is very, very soothing and, and good for the soul. I think that's not to say that we can't all have that experience, but anyhow, it was a wonderful experience growing up. And, and there's something uh, in Beth's background, and I think it's probably true for many of you as well, that there was something very early in life Mm -hmm. And they began to tell you that there's something more. They begin to introduce you into a kind of mysticism of the universe, if you will. And we're going to hear about that from Beth. So Beth was an honest, uh, sincere student of the Course of Miracles, went through it, uh, then got going back through it again. And as a process of the part of her going back through and reading the Course, she asked for help. <laughs> you know, if you read my Sunday with Monday passage this morning, it was about asking the Holy Spirit to help us make our decisions. So anyhow, that was her first book, which was Awakening to One Love, which was facilitated her in understanding 
the lessons in A Course of Miracles. And then uh, she began to have uh, more experiences, also going back to childhood, where in dreams, she began to become in, in contact with something more than the ordinary. And I'm going to let her talk about this extraordinary experience that she had. So uh, welcome, Beth. And uh, let's sort of just share with folks a little bit about how you how you got to doing the work that you're doing now and uh, we'll have fun. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, John and Bud for having me here. And I'm, I, this is exciting. And, you know, interviews are so much easier than a prepared talk because uh, mm. you can say what you need to, or whatever comes up and, and I'm, you never have to worry about something not coming up. I don't I think I have too much trouble with dead air, but <laughs> um, yeah. That happen with you. No. <laughs> There'll be no dead air with that. Okay. <laughs> I did tell John if he needs to speak, it's okay to interrupt me so he's not being rude. Or just John, wave your hand. Hey, before we move too far off of that thought, I have to add something or, or ask something. Yeah. Um, right. If I if I don't pick up on social cues that I've been going on like a runaway train. <laughs> um, <laughs> Go ahead, run away. So so yes, I have been spiritual since as as um, the earliest first thing that I can remember is when I was five. And I think I shared this in my previous interview about the cactus blooming on my windowsill the morning after I asked God if he could hear me when I say my nightly prayers. I was raised Catholic. So, you know, I said the Our Father, the Hail Mary and the act of contrition every night. And then I added a few of my own words and thoughts. And, and uh, I had wondered if God could in a nutshell, so tell the story again real quick. I, I didn't know if maybe I should be praying out loud. Should I kneel in front of the window so God can see me? Um, or can I just say the words in my mind? And so I knelt in front of the window and I had a cactus on the windowsill um, just as part of my room. And I know I was five because it was before I received first communion. And in the Catholic church that happens at sixth grade or first grade when you're between six and seven. So I knelt and prayed and I had my cactus in between my elbows on the windowsill. And then the next morning when I opened the curtains, it had three big pink blooms on it, which, you know, I th take that to mean the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you know, three is one of those numbers and uh, representing the Holy Trinity. And I ran downstairs, told my family about the miracle. And I have an older brother and two younger brothers. And I think the older brother or one of my parents said, well, you know, cacti bloom after they've been watered and they do it suddenly overnight in the desert. <laughs> and I said, well, I, yep. I don't know if it was watered or not. I don't remember. It probably was, but um, it was the timing of that. That cactus had never done that. And it's been watered hundreds of times, you know, in my lifetime. So uh, it was the timing and that still is a miracle. Coincidences and synchronicities are always to me signs that, uh, things are lining up exactly as they need to be for you to learn what you need to learn. And so that even like the fact that I was saying my prayers, I don't remember ever not knowing about God or not praying to God or believing in God. And, um, you know, throughout my childhood, I'd have moments of feeling like I was sent to the wrong place. <laughs> like there is something else. And I have vague memories of magicalness that I, I was always attracted to science fiction because that felt more closer to what I remember, just the, the magicalness of things um, happening without struggle. And it was somewhere so very good. And I've always had the feeling that I was given an assignment. And I even to this day, I still will have bouts of feeling how much longer, <laughs> how much longer does is this going to go on, you know, and, and not that I'm suicidal at all. It's just, how much more do I have to go? <laughs> and, and uh, so there was always that feeling of this is not home, which I think everyone can identify with to some degree, you know, of, of just feeling tired of this business. And uh, so I've always pursued the supernatural, but um, in tandem with, with, you know, reading my childhood Bible, looking for answers. I read that several times and um, I would have these strange extraterrestrial experiences as well. And I, if you have my book already, you know, then in my, I believe it's in my preface or the first chapter, I talk about my childhood experiences 
of being aboard craft and looking out the window of the craft twice on once was down on my farm I could see the horses in the pasture in the moonlight it was the appropriate hour of the day for you know if I was taken in the middle of the night it was appropriate that I see them in the moonlight I could see my parents our my house and our yard and the barns and I could see us slowly moving over the landscape and then another time um I was on board a craft and I looked out the window, I could see the river valley, I could see the church, I recognized the steeple, the town of Henderson, where I grew up, um, and we floated along the river valley. And so what an odd thing to, to dream about and to have it so real and vivid. And many times I'd wake up and I'd be standing somewhere else, like either in the middle of my bedroom floor or somewhere in the house. My parents said I would sleepwalk a lot. I would just suddenly come out of a room <laughs> And there, well, how did you get down here? We didn't, you know, we didn't even hear you. And, and what are you doing? And I don't know why I'm out here. And one time I was, uh, I must have been outside. I came in, I didn't put this in my book, because I, there was no memory link to it. But I walked in the front door. And what woke me up was the sound of the front door making the door sound. And I thought, what on earth was I doing outside? It's cold. And I just wound up on the front step for some reason. And um, so I have memories. And then an actual sighting when I was 16 being brought home from a movie date with my then boyfriend. And he witnessed craft in the sky with me. And um, that was just a light above the field. And on my actually my at the time, my grandparents farm, which we now bought that property and um, we built our house on the little hill where the light was shining above and as my husband and I were staring down at the the basement that just got excavated and they were pouring the foundation I said oh by the way I saw a UFO above this hill once and he's like well it's too late now <laughs> we're gonna live here I totally forgot about it and now we're living in the spot where I saw the UFO which I completely forgot about when we bought the property but um so it's been on and off throughout my whole life. I've had strange extraterrestrial experiences alongside a lot of um, paranormal investigation. I had a phase, which I still do this to some degree, but not, um, it's like I went through a phase where people kept approaching me with poltergeist stories or hauntings or deceased loved ones that they wanted to make sure were okay because it was a suicide and some person told them they all go to hell and I'm like, no. <laughs> and that's like the most horrible thing anyway and and really so someone cries out the hardest it's so in such a deep despair that they take their own life and then God says to heck with you you don't know <laughs> he doesn't say that to anybody but that would be like the last thing that person needs you know no. and um um so anyway I you know having facts about things just for a while there was this I was steeped in this this psychicness and um it just kept evolving until I found A Course in Miracles and that just opened up my whole world and I I read it to the exclusion of everything else for quite a while, for several years as I was taking it in. I didn't want any distractions or any kind of influence from any other people's writings. Um, <clears throat> I did make a few exceptions. I read John Mundy's uh, Living a Course in Miracles because I just was led to get that book and it was much thinner and I, it did supplement my understanding. I also read like Gary Gennard's um, disappearance of the universe. Um, he had some insights on, on the course as well that also helped deepen my own understanding as well as when I wrote my own book and asked for help before I read anything else. And just it started to flow through and I would take down um, like I'd read the lesson in the morning and then repeat it throughout the day at work whenever I got a chance. And I knew understanding that that voice would come at some point during the day to guide me onto the meaning of the lesson. And sometimes it was right before bed and I'd quick jump out of bed and write it all down. It would be just a, like a paragraph or so. And then uh, sometimes it would come at work and I would have to stop everything and quick write down a few notes so I wouldn't forget. I, it reminded me of Helen's shorthand. Like it would come so fast. I'd just write down the keywords and the key ideas. And then when I sat down to type it, it would all still be there. It would fill in um, the shorthand notes. And that became my first book. And that was that was life changing to go through that process, because 
I thought, okay, this is coming together as a book, but I'm going to ask all these questions about death and world peace and what, you know, just all the questions. And um, I, I was sure, especially when I asked the question on world peace and I started getting the answer about like how the government would be set up. And it was unlike anything I'd ever heard of. And this is in my first book. And it was set up with the 12 areas of need. And I thought of that the first three came to me and then there was nothing. And I thought, well, sure, I'm not going to just making this all up. How will I think of 12 areas of need that are, you know, that make any sense? And I woke up at three in the morning and they were all there. And I quick wrote it all down. I'm like, okay, there's the rest of them. And and uh, along the way, I just thought I can't be making this up because these are ideas I've never had. And I'm surprised by what I'm getting. So then fast forward two kids and a farm and a husband and some animals later, I had another very profound UFO experience. And that was on a camping trip in 2020. We were um, hiking up north on the Duluth Superior hiking trail with nothing but our backpacks. It was a uh, um, I forget what you call it, but you, you take everything with you and you hike for miles. You don't, you'd have your tent on your back. You don't drive in. You, we, so we had hiked in four miles and planned to go on like another six the next day to the second location. And as I laid in my sleeping bag that night, I was so tired and I was laying on my back face up and the face of this extra extraterrestrial came into my mind and it was so clear and vivid and I was just in awe of her beauty and I thought well this is interesting and um she started to speak to me and the conversation is in my book and she introduced herself and said her name was Aya and it's early on in the conversation, I realized I can still feel my sleeping bag around me and I can feel I'm laying on my back in a tent but I'm still seeing the vision. Why didn't it go away? Because dreams go away when you wake up, you know, and why didn't this disappear from my mind? And it, it never faltered and it didn't go away till we were done with our conversation. And the whole next day I thought about that and I thought, I, I don't think that was a dream. I think she actually reached out to me in my mind and I was able to see her so clearly and, and the conversation was so clear. I didn't feel like I was talking to myself telepathic experience. So I didn't, I didn't write that down right away until I had another encounter with another being that I had to name her because in her language, they speak with sound music. And she said, it's like our dolphins and whales, but it sounds like actual melodic sound, which I, she let me hear and it, I can't even describe it, but she describes it best. She says, one of our individuals can make sound so beautiful it would take your people an entire symphony to reproduce it Whoa. and one individual can do that can make these sounds and so their language is very complex so I have to translate what I feel into a word and at one point in my book I said how can we do this how can we have totally different languages and I can understand everything you say perfectly and she said well you know who the universal translator is you you call him the holy spirit and have you not communicated with plants and animals? And they've responded. I'm like, you are right. I've had success interacting with my pets and things and conveying things. And, and um, one time we had added a, just a side story. We had added a new horse to our herd from my parents' farm. I took a horse from him. And the other two were excluding her from food. Like I'd have to make her her own hay pile at a distance from the other two, which were mother and son, they were very bonded and didn't want this third horse in there. And so they would harass her all the time over the food. And I was just standing there in the winter with my arms on the gate thinking, Blondie, I am so sorry. I don't know why they're treating you this way. I, when will they ever learn to love you? Are you okay? Are you getting enough to eat? Are you suffering? That horse stopped what she was doing. She was eating her hay. And in the winter, horses are very covetous of their food because you only get fed when we decide to feed you. And they run out, you know, throughout the day. She stopped eating her hay and walked over to me and nuzzled my arm with her, with her lip and nose and just stood there for a minute. 
And it was like, I could feel her saying, I am just fine. This is how we are. This is how horses are. You, <laughs> it's all fine. I understand everything. And it's, I'm, I'm happy and content. Wow. And she's never done that before or since. So I'm like, I know I've had success communicating in both the plant animal and um, the unseen kingdom of of angels and fairies and Sasquatch and all that stuff. I've been have I've, I have so many stories of physical um, signs and cues. So anyway, that being said, this this Martha reached out to me and she's an aquatic being from a very distant place, both on dimension and physical reality. And that became my book, Awakening Humanity, because her message flowed so perfectly with A Course in Miracles. And I thought, well, is that partly my own filter? And she said, this is the way we live in the evolved physical world and beyond this. The course is how we live. And she said, humanity is waking up and you're going to meet the rest of us. And um, so I guess I'll, I'll stop there for a second. If anybody, if John or anybody has anything to say about that. We'll, we'll have uh, questions and answers a little bit okay. uh, later, but right now we'll just continue to dialogue you and I. I thought it was interesting last week, we had Sebastian Blakely on and in a conversation between he and I and Bud, which did not get uh, put onto the final recording. Uh, I was talking to him about what you're doing. And he said that he had also had contact uh not with extraterrestrials but with mm -hmm. angels right and uh that in one case i in particular there wasn't a name they couldn't didn't have a name that right. they could give us like because it was more universal than that mm -hmm. i thought that was an interesting overlap between the two of you that it's not necessarily these names are just labels that we mm -hmm. use in this world they're they're i i say many many times there will be a john monday in heaven which just means it's not about that. It's not about the form. It's not about the body. It's something much more universal. What seems to me that you're tapping into here, here is this wholly, really exciting dimension of universal consciousness, yes, which is pervasive of the universe. And it's not a physical thing necessarily, right. not that you can't have a physical expression, but right. physicality is actually kind of a limitation in form. Mm -hmm. so, you agree with that and go on from there. I just yes. And you know, speaking of form, you had asked me, I think it was um, before the interview last time, and it was off group recording. It was our uh -huh. private conversation. You had said something about, I mean, you had a question about levels because in my book, yes. it's about, so I had an, a writer uh, a week or two after my book was released, um, a, a woman wrote in and said, I just want to clarify about levels because isn't there, either what is real and what is not real and what is real is eternal and what is not real is physical but it seems like there's levels in your book that Martha talks about and I said yes and I said that's a very good question um there is so much more after we discover our divinity and our eternal nature and after we're done with this specific physical form um, I, it's like, I think before I would just think, okay, according to the course and, and just you, you leave your body and then you're just part of the oneness and then that's it. And then I also would think, well, how boring is that? <laughs> what does that even entail? You know, you just float off into this oneness and never to be seen again, or what happens? And Martha cracked open a whole new thought process that, it's like um, when you're a kindergartner, you know you're a human being, but you don't just jump into adulthood there. You mm -hmm. can't really call it levels. I guess you could call it stages of development. Mm -hmm. And while we may lose our physicality when we move on with our forgiveness of this world and move out of time and space, you don't lose the levels of learning, that there's so much more to learn about, that God is more than just a oneness. There is so much diversity and we can't even conceive of it. And even the course says at the end of the workbook lessons, there's an epilogue and it says this course is not the end. It's just the very beginning. Yeah. So once you finally identify with your oneness as your identity and not um, these separate bodies, you get to go on to greater and grander vistas. And Martha touches on those in my book. And, and I had another person ask, well, can you describe what these things look like, what these places, these, I can't, because we've no frame of reference. It's like trying to describe 
to a fish what an ant experiences. They're yeah. two different <laughs> worlds. One is underground and one is in water and, you know, and then throwing a bird and they have a whole other world. And um, yeah, it's, it's like we're, we're kindergartners and we're just graduating. But according to Martha, we have so much potential as human beings and the people who get through this program here on planet earth of, of learning our lessons in love and letting down the barriers to love's presence as it teaches in the course. Um, we are magnificent on the other side. Like you can spot a human soul from forever. Like there, there, we are aspired by other um, beings to, um, to as, as a, um, a, a role model. Um, and, and Martha says too, that there is, there's just souls clambering to be on this planet at this time. Our population has exploded for a reason. And that is because everyone wants to be here during this event, this shift. Mm -hmm. And it is a, a shift into a new earth, which the course talks about the real world. And, and you, you do it as one, which only makes sense if we're one and including the animals, the plants, the other people, and the planet herself has a consciousness and an energy. And I guess, I can accept that because God is in and through everything. And um, so, you know, that it, it's, it seems like a stretch at first. And then the more I thought about it, the more I could accept it. And, and so this whole Martha thing, this aquatic being coming through to me, it took me a while to even decide if this was real or was I just making this up? And, and I had sent um, some test chapters to Glenn uh, Hovman and, and just to see what he thought and, and he encouraged me to keep going. And one thing that I knew that it wasn't me making it up was because I would have questions. And in the beginning, I'd have to wait a, a month or two or weeks and sometimes days for an answer. And I thought if I was making this all up, I would just have the answer, you know, and make up the answer immediately. But I would have to wait for a time when Martha could get through to me and when I was receptive to her. And it was always like um, driving or just waking up or just falling asleep. And when my mind, my, my barriers were the thinnest. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I wouldn't wait for an answer. If I was making this up, I just continue to make up my BS. <laughs> 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 and then I, I have to wait for an answer so long and I'm, it's not in my control. So I thought, okay, there is a second aspect here that I'm interacting with for sure. And oh, and I was, I was telling um, some of the early Zoom joiners that I since the book, um, you know, it's, it's so beautiful out at night, and I'm very drawn to lay out in my lawn chair once it gets dark and just lay out there for anywhere from 10 to 30 to 45 minutes. And just stare at the sky and put out my my loving energy and just reach out and say, if you vibrate with this, just let I just want to let you know you're safe here with me. I hope I'm safe with you. <clears throat> and I only want the positives, you know, to, to hear that they're welcome. And um, I had a couple occurrences. Almost every night will I see a few flashes of light. One night I saw what looked like what you could describe as a comet, but it streaked across the entire sky and stayed the same brightness and then shot straight up into the air. Okay, comets don't do that. Oh. And um, two very intense experiences. One was I was laying on the, the lawn chair. It's the kind you can lay on full body, like flat. And so I'm just staring, laying on my back, staring up at the sky, at the stars. And I could feel... I could feel myself being observed from a very particular spot in the sky. I could mm. feel this very benevolent, loving attention. And I tested, I'd look around other parts of the sky. Nope, it is right there. Whatever it is, is right there. And then two things happened that told me there, were, there was a, a ship there. One was I saw a satellite going across the sky. It was a clear night. I saw the satellite going across the sky and then it disappeared, disappeared for a while and reappeared over here. And I went, oh my gosh, there is a ship cloaked. It went behind the ship. It was here, disappeared for a span of sky and reappeared over here. I followed the track of the, the satellite. And when I had that thought, I saw a big flash and it like, like that. They were confirming my thought that there's a cloaked ship in the sky. 
Then this happened on Monday night. I was laying out there and I was, for some reason, I was thinking of the crucifixion of Christ. And I was thinking of um, Judas and how, how he must have felt. And I thought, well, you know, he can't bear all the guilt. We're all part of one mind. He is an aspect of my one mind. I guess as a whole community of creation, we bear that guilt with him because mm. he's a part of us. And um, mm. like, I felt like we shouldn't, you know, like Judas isn't just the only one who crucified Christ. Like we, it was this whole big thought of a shared responsibility of loving God. Mm. And just as I had that thought in the exact same spot, I had the weird anomaly a week or two before another flash and then a smaller flash and then another one that flashed three more times as it faded off and I thought that's interesting mm. that coincidence that that anomaly shows up in the sky just as I'm having this thought like they're confirming my thoughts that when I'm laying there extending myself they can hear us because they are telepathic mm. but telepathy doesn't just automatically work or your head would be full of everything um, you have to specifically be reaching out and there has to be someone to receive um, or it doesn't work. Just like our conversation here online. If you guys weren't all linked into the zoom, there'd be no one to hear this. So anyway, those are my two, well, handful of, of, but pretty much every night when I go out, I will see something strange almost every time. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got to meet Martha and a little bit about what Martha has to share with us. And in particular, I think that we're all interested in the fact that, I sense that there's millions of us who sense that there's something else happening now. Partly this is related to old structures no longer working, churches are dying, for example. At the same time that that's true, I think we're needing to go in deeper. I remember back in uh, in the 60s, uh, being a part of the, you know, the hippie movement and uh, the dawning of the age of Aquarius and something was happening. And mm -hmm. then it seems like we kind of went back into computers and physicality and and yet at the same time, it's still going on. But now there's another kind of birth of that that's yes. coming to us all. So you want to address that a little bit? Yeah. So um, Martha came into my life. Um, I had another very vivid um, dream or, or lucid dream, I guess you could call it, where um, just like when Aya showed up in my mind when I was camping and I was aware of my surroundings that I was in my sleeping bag. And yet, even though I knew I was awake, her face didn't disappear. Um, I had a dream that I was in my parents' hay barn on their farm. And there was a creature in the hay kind of half buried. And I walked up to it and I instantly knew, I said, oh my goodness, it's a female. And her voice came into my mind and she said, no, I'm a woman, meaning that she's equal to me in spirit, that she's not just an animal. She's another human being in a different kind of body. I'm a woman. And I went, oh my gosh, I looked at her face and I saw how unusual she looked. She was aquatic. She had, her eyes were round, but they glowed with an inner light and it was beautiful. Um, round, dark pupils with almost amber to white light eyes just a small little bump for a nose that kind of came to a point. It was very aerodynamic. Like you would expect something that moved through the air or the water would be shaped, but her mouth was so strange. It was like, it reminded me of a snail with like some little, those little whiskers they have that they can move and grab things mm -hmm. with, but it wasn't ugly. She was absolutely stunningly beautiful to me and her skin. I could see it could change color like an octopus and it was smooth, like a, like an octopus and she said, I need your help. And I was instantly, how can I help you? And she said, I need water. And I said, okay, I'm going to go get you a, a huge five gallon pail of water. I'll be right back. And she said, no, 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 don't take too long. A, a glass of water is fine. Even a wet washcloth would be fine. Just any little bit of water. Don't be gone a long time. I said, okay. So I went through the whole motion. I went and got a glass from my parents' kitchen and ran back down to her. And she took it and was drinking it. And I could see her eyes above the glass and they connected right into mine. And I felt it like she could see my soul. And I woke up and I was suddenly aware that I was laying in my bed on my back in my covers. I could hear my husband next to me sleeping. He some, you know, he's 
old man making his old man sleeping noises, <laughs> not necessarily <laughs> a snore, but I could hear him breathing. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, he's not an old man. He's 54. That's young. <laughs> and, um, huh, I was that. like, but the dream didn't dissipate. And there was still Martha connected with her eyes and I could feel everything around me in my physical reality. But I was in this, this vivid lucid dream world, this other reality. So I was bilocated was how that felt. And I said, Martha, or I didn't know her name yet. I said, we're not, we're not dreaming. I'm not dreaming. Am I? And she said, no, um, you're, this is real. We're really having this conversation. And and we got to the part where I asked her name and she said, there isn't a word in your language for my name, but feel my vibration. What do I feel like to you? And then you can give me a name. And, and I just instantly thought, Martha, you feel like to me, that's a warm, motherly, sisterly, wise and loving, tender person. Mm -hmm. And that's how she felt like a wise, yet motherly, yet sisterly person and very, very deeply loving. And so she went on to show me then her whole body, like whatever I asked for, she would show me her arms and legs and, and how, where her fins were and how that all worked. And then she was, boop, she was just gone. And I fully woke up and I thought, wow, that was a cool dream. You know, like what the <laughs> heck? And, and uh, then like a month or two later, she appeared in my mind again and we resumed our conversation and it got to be where I could be fully awake. And as long as my mind was in a relaxed state, um, we could have a conversation um, to the point now where sometimes I'll be thinking something and she'll pop in in the background and, and add to it or correct things or um, just just she'll just jump in. And, um, you know, we went on to share a lot of talks about her planet and how her people live. Um, they are ninth through 12th density which means that once you reach the 12th density, you are no longer physical at all. You are literally a being of light. And I know, you know, the course talks about there is a reality beyond this one that's still not real. It's the happy world, the happy illusion. And I think that's what that's referring to because they, they're still physical on their world, but not all of them. And yet they can all interact and still see their, their crossed over loved ones, even though they're not in a body anymore, because the ones that are, are in bodies are so elevated themselves. And um, they're sort of experiencing the, the, the illusion of a physical body as well as glimpses of, of the world without that. And what happens after we lose our physicality, Martha says, we, we can't describe it to you because some of us have tried to, you know, they come back and try to describe it, but they can't, there's no frame of reference. It's completely opposite um, to our physical experience and miraculous and awesome in every way. Like there are no words to describe the level of love we'll experience. And what we have to do uh, for, for work on the other side, which as she described, even their work on their planet is not how we think of work here. It isn't a drudgery and it isn't, it's, it's like your life's passion would be a better word for what you do. You get to live your life's passion. And there are so many new avenues that open up where you can live your life's passion. It's like, imagine being someone who could come back to earth and influence people as a <laughs> extraterrestrial being, you know, how wonderful would that be to come back and say, Hey, wake up sleepies. There's so much more out there. And, and there's a lot to do. You got to stop wasting time on this dream world and come join the rest of us. So yes, what John was talking about, we are going through a shift. I think, you know, I, I think about how the course talks about how your loving thoughts go out to the people around you and help them. And then I think I'm receiving their loving thoughts too. anyone who gets it and is sending it out. They're helping me. I want to try and be aware of that help that I can feel that love coming to me and not just always me trying to beam it out and then going, yep, that's it. I can't feel anything coming back. Try and be aware of what comes back to you because I think that's what's helping me. Well, is that's, a part a, of, that's a part of you giving her the water, right? I mean, that's yes. A, yeah, you yes. have to give her the water 
in order for her to give back to me, there was an exchange that had, that's the- Yes, oh, yeah. we, we had to form a connection because um, I asked Martha, why did you make me do all that? You didn't need water. You weren't really dying. You weren't being chased or hiding from anybody. I go, why did you make me go get you water in, in this pretend scenario? And she said, when you help someone, you lose your fear of them. Because uh, if you see someone suffering and it doesn't matter what they look like, what nationality, what language they speak, if you see them and you help them, you suddenly love them because you're helping them and you're drawn to do this to help another person who seems like, well, I can do that. I can get a glass of water or, oh, you know what? I can, whatever, you know, help someone struggling with a bag of groceries or whatever. You suddenly feel, you never do that and feel angry. And she said that developed our communication so that I could talk to you. Cause she said, if you're fearful at all, you will not be able to hear me. And in hindsight, that is just like the Holy spirit. When we're in fear and depression or anger, <laughs> We're not I think someone just came on. Yeah. Yeah. Bud, can you? Uh, got it. Got it. Okay, Bud's got it. There you okay. go. So love in the spirit of helpfulness will always triumph over all forms of fear and instantly open up communication between you and anything. And this extends to, from what I, I learned from Martha and I apply it to my daily life, um, inanimate objects even, like there is a stillness, a joined connection between ourselves and every physical thing that we think is separate from us and really is not separate. And so sometimes I will practice being aware of that. I will be aware of my clothes and just, okay, this is interconnected. It's, it's so, it's peaceful. It's resting on me. Um, there's a napkin sitting on the table. That, that napkin is very still. It's almost zen-like how still that napkin or that tube of chapstick, or I've used the stapler at work that aggravates me because it continuously jams. And ever since I pictured it as perfectly still resting in God's stillness, it is so quiet until I pick it up and start beating it on the counter to unjam it. <laughs> And, that's, and that seems so violent and like such an attack. And I thought, I'm going to just appreciate how quiet it is when it's resting. And it hasn't jammed since. We've since lost. We don't know which stapler that is anymore because it all of them work now really well. You know what work. this reminds me of is uh, like a child. I, when I was a child, I had a black cloth doll, which was made for me by my aunt Marie. And Joe was alive. Mm -hmm. I thought Joe was alive. You know, it was, in fact, as I had this unfortunate epiphany when I was nine that he wasn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, <know>? yes. <laughs> and I, I had to give up on that. <laughs> but he, he, he really is alive. It's just yeah. the inanimate objects, objects cannot express themselves. I think of even my horses. A horse is really limited in their facial yeah. expressions. They really can't do a lot but they do a lot with their ears and their body language. And um, just because something can't express itself in a way we understand or quickly enough, like plants and how they grow and they're responding to our thoughts about them. And I had a plant and this is a, a story of, of communicating with the plant world. I had a plant, a succulent that I was gonna move it out of a very small jar. Well, it was a mason jar and they come narrow at the top. So it's got this big wide root ball at the bottom and I couldn't get it out. And in the process of trying to get it free of this jar and this, this hard root ball that had way overgrown its container um, out of this narrow opening, I pulled one of its main branches off. And I went, oh, there's, what's gonna happen? <laughs> Succulents are really resilient. You can plant a teeny leaf and it'll regrow. But I didn't wanna lose this big, beautiful thing. And I asked it, I said, are you okay? I said, did I kill you? And I didn't hear the plant, but I heard the spirit watching over the plant just in a small voice say in my head, we can work with this. It's okay. <laughs> and it was fine. It just, and somehow it grew. It's like, you can't even tell now where the arm broke off and it, it, it's like, okay, it's, it's everything just because it can't react immediately. Um, it, they all have feelings. They all, and, and it doesn't mean you have to walk on eggshells on your lawn. Like, Oh, should I be stepping on the grass? No, it all, loves to participate with us from the world that Martha has opened up with me nature 
wants us to interact with it. If we make a path through a forest, that is awesome because it allows us to walk into the nature and allows nature and, and ourselves, our beingness to interact. It's when there's wanton destruction and, and um, you know, doing things just to destroy. Uh, but the shared presence of all things seems to be the theme of our extraterrestrial visitors. And according to Martha, we have been visited many, many times throughout Earth's history that we are, have not been abandoned in any way. Um, but there aren't always positive intent. And she didn't go into that because she said that is for others to tell. That was not the purpose of our contact for this book. Um, so she, she stayed with the positive um, and she did. She talked about Adam and Eve, which blew my mind away that they were real people, not the first humans, but they were visitors from another dimension and they came to upgrade us physically and spiritually. And um, we've had guides all along the way, both internal and our elder brothers and sisters that are helping nurture us because what happens to us happens to them because they understand the oneness. And they know if you let one of your factions falter, uh, it affects everybody in the intergalactic community of that's still struggling with physical bodies. Um, it's like ignoring our own human beings that need help. Um, that are asking for help spiritually or physically otherwise. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard the stories of the times nuclear weapons and things have been deactivated mysteriously. They're watching. They do not want us to blow up the planet. That is not in our best interests or anyone else's. Yay. <laughs> right? <laughs> We're being helped. They are not going to let us fall on our faces. Um, it's in their best interest. And I think in my own mind, it reflects poorly on them. <laughs> Like your kids didn't turn out the greatest. Um, what did you do wrong? <laughs> there is joint responsibility here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yes. There you go, but can you say yeah. so? we're only about ten minutes? But this is going so fast. Oh my gosh! I yeah, I haven't even no, watched no, okay. the time. Well, yeah, I want, I want people to be able to come on and dialogue yeah. and ask your questions and that sort of thing. But before that, could you talk a little bit about angels? Which, yes. I think that's important because uh, Sebastian Blakely last week was also talking about angels and where that fits in. That seems like an important mention. But then also in terms of the future of humanity and how we need to be growing through the next whatever phase it is we've got to go through here. Yes. And then we'll turn around and begin another 10 minutes or so to have questions. Yes, I have a whole chapter dedicated to um, angels. Some of it was not a surprise and some of it was. And it was one of them was when Martha said, well, not everyone has their pair of angels. Angels do work in pairs and you can even have groups of angels over groups of people. Um, there are angels protecting our pets and, and everything has a divine assistance. Um, especially if you're not aware of your inner teacher, your inner voice, um, the Holy Spirit that we, they also are there uh, guiding us and theirs is not to do any work for us or to make life any easier, but to help us move through our trials and lessons with more grace. They won't take away all our trials, but they will help us move through them. And when we grow, they grow. So there it is again, it reflects on them. How well we do reflects on them. And the reason why not everyone gets angels is because you have to be receptive to their help. They aren't gonna waste their time on someone who, what Martha alluded to, the, the people who are uh, mentally handicapped. Like you have angels just in general, but they, if they can't get through to your mind, if you're not able to process their mm -hmm. divine inspirations, and that's how their voices come through, is they come through as inspiration. You might feel guided to take a left instead of a right on your walk, and then you bump into someone who's profound in your life after that, and you meet someone you're supposed to meet. Um, or even smaller things like, oh, thank goodness I left work five minutes late. I missed that horrible accident. Mm. You were divinely guided into things and sometimes they steer you right into the head of of conflict because that's what you need <laughs> that that's one of your things you need to um yeah. learn from okay. and so you just have to trust your intuition and that is is what's connected to them 
Um, they learn along with us. This is that's part of their role is instead of physically having to come do this work, they help us with our work and we grow together and they are for all eternity. The angels you are assigned are your deepest friends and your most beloved trusted companions and we have them once once the soul and the angel pair are assigned to each other it's it's a bond for all eternity and i loved that idea that you never part from them and i love that there are you know if you have a group of people who get together for a purpose there's angels of people who meet with course and miracles <laughs> there are they help facilitate all kinds of things and again, it's just like everything, though, if you don't ask for help, it's really difficult to give it because we have free will. We have free will um, to accept or deny any kind of assistance. And so just always be open to the positive in your life. And that you know, I'm open to any help here. I, I really, one of my best go-to lines in my mind when I feel struggle or any kind of just down feeling, remember, you don't know anything. You don't know what this world is for. You don't know what anybody looks like in truth without their bodies or what their role is in your life. You think it's this or that or the next thing, but you don't know. You don't know the underlying bigger picture and purpose. And so your job is only to forgive. And the Course says to forgive is to overlook. So we overlook the physical and grab at that unity we know lies deep within all of us. Um, I like the way the Course of Miracles says there are no accidents in salvation. Oh. And and for all of us, you know, I we go through things and we think, why the heck did I have to go through that? Right. But right. You know, especially when it's a difficult kind of thing. I mm. lost a business that I owned back in 1989. And I thought, but that was perfect because it got me back on the, doing the course more seriously and mm. getting back onto where I had to be. So I had to go through that as a part of this. And you look, go through a divorce or a bankruptcy or something. And why in the world do I have to do this or an illness or something? Mm -hmm. Yet behind it, if it gets you back onto the right road, that's what had to happen. You know? Yep. 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 I had that happen with my job when I lost, when the pharmacy I worked for closed in December of 2018, a week before Christmas. And then I had a job that I was very unhappy at for seven months found the job I'm in now. And I thought I would have never found the pharmacy yeah. I am now if I hadn't gone through all that, yeah. you know, God bless the broken road, <laughs> the, the country <laughs> song, God bless the broken road that led me to you. Yeah. And, and it really is, it's, you just have to trust the process. You have yeah. to trust the process. Um, this is a side thing, but one time my husband and I were snowboarding, we were out in the mountains of Montana, big sky. And I woke up in the night. Uh, it was our last um, day there. The next day, we were leaving um, the morning after that night. We we're going to snowboard all day and then spend one more night and leave in the morning. And so we had one more day, full day of, of uh, snowboarding on the mountain. And in the middle of the night at 4 a.m., I woke up to a voice that said, do not go on Challenger Peak. And I said, OK, why not? And the voice said, well, you will have a bad accident. You will fall and injure your right hip in such a way that walking will be difficult for you for the rest of your life. It will be a permanent injury. You'll walk, but you will not run again. You will not ride horses again. You will never snowboard again. It, you'll be mobile. You won't need a wheelchair, but it will be a permanent injury to your hip that will never go away. Oh. And I said, okay, so why are you warning me about this? And the voice said, and I was only on lesson 50 of the Course in Miracles. That was my first trip through the lessons. So I hadn't even completed the course yet. And the voice said, well, you've completed enough of your forgiveness lessons that this experience is no longer necessary for you to learn what you need to learn. You get to bypass this one. I said, okay. Um, however, my husband loves Challenger Peak because it really was a challenge. You went to the tippy top of this peak, uh, one of the highest points in the, the snowboard park. And it was a sheer edge on either side. And you had to go across this little ledge. And then you could go down and there were rocks everywhere. It was hard to see. There was high winds. And there were little two-seat chairs going to the top. It was very scary. <laughs> and, and at the bottom of Challenger Peak, there was a sign that said, experience skiers only. Do not take a moderate to new person up here. It, we have fatalities every year. Oh, my gosh. That made my husband want to go up there all the more. <laughs> 
<laughs> He's that kind of person. Oh. And I said, how, how will I keep Paul from wanting to go up there? Because what if he says, let's go up here again, because I know he will. Mm -hmm. I said, what do, what do I do? And they said, you don't worry about him. We'll take care of him. I said, okay. So I, I just went back to sleep and I thought, okay. So the next day I didn't say a word about this to him because I thought if I tell him, he will specifically want to go up there just to challenge this warning not to go up there. Like, I don't know if he, I think he'll take it as a challenge to go up there. So I said nothing. So on our last day, um, we both agreed we hadn't experienced the way far, far, far side of the mountain yet because it takes a lot to get over there. You have to go up and down several runs to work your way across. Let's go check that out. We had our last day. Let's go do that. And he said, um, let's take the long way. It's kind of a, a gentle slope, but it's one big trail that gently takes you around the whole base of the mountain until you get to the bottom of the chairlift on the far side. And we figured it'd take us a couple hours to make the trip. It was like four miles of snowboarding. <laughs> wow. And it was because it's a mountain, you know. And at one point we stopped to rest. And I looked and there's a chairlift and it said Challenger Peak. I'm like, oh, we're at the base of Challenger. And I go, oh, there's Challenger Peak chairlift. He goes, oh, you know what? If we took this chairlift up and just go right down the other side, it would bring us to that far side of the mountain. I, he's like, I forgot that this chairlift takes you to the very, very top. And if we ski down the other side, we'll, we'll be where we want to be in about 20 minutes. And I went, yeah. And he goes, you know what? I'm just not feeling it. I feel like we should steer clear of that today. I, I think we'll keep our long, slow journey. I feel like we shouldn't go up there. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> good job, guys. <laughs> the angels influenced him. They're like, don't worry about him. We will take care of him. So we had a very safe day. We got back to our, our room and I told him what had happened the night before. He, he got like tears in his eyes. He's like, I cannot believe we narrowly missed going up there he goes I seriously considered it I just got a feeling in my gut no and so anyway that I'm sorry I took up 10 more minutes but it's a little off. This is just, it's 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 on, but it's... I'm sorry <laughs> I, my life is full of that kind of thing I, I know I, it is yeah but anyway so about five or ten minutes from now I want to start bringing people on to ask uh, questions and dialogue with you I have a sense that people want to, a little, a little, look, want to know a little bit more about what Martha had to share with you and then we're going to switch over to dialoguing with the folks that are here. Sounds good. And we do have some questions in chat too. Okay. You want to go ahead and deal with what's in chat? Have your contacts with ETs had anything to say about the COVID pandemic and its effect on our enlightenment? Yes. Um, the overall feeling I get, and this is, uh, I can't, it's, it's from Martha, it's from just in general, the main thing was to overcome fear. And as a pharmacist, you know, I was a vaccinator. I vac helped vaccinate over 4,000 people. And I would have every kind of person sitting in my chair. And I did ask for assistance. How do I deal with the fear? Because I'd have the person sitting in my chair that was afraid to get the shot because if they didn't, they were going to get fired. You know, I had multiple people there was um, that when that was happening with Mm -hmm. employers forcing their employees, you know, either you lose your job or you get the shot. Then I had the people sitting in my chair who were afraid because they didn't want to get COVID and couldn't get that, that shot fast enough. They couldn't, you know, get their booster fast enough. That was, they were afraid of COVID itself. So there were two camps of people. Everyone basically was afraid to get the shot and to not get the shot. And uh, I asked Martha and the powers that be, I'm like, what do I say? And they said, the inner response I got was, well, the main thing is to do the thing that causes you the least amount of fear. If you feel better being isolated in your house, if that takes away fear for you, then, then that's what you need to do. If you feel better getting the vaccine, I said, what about all the conspiracy theories? Is this changing our DNA and, and anything <laughs> like that? Or what is all this? And, and they said, none of it matters. Remember, it's an illusion. And it will be positive or negative in experience based on how you are projecting it. So if you feel protected by getting the shot, you're protected. If you feel protected from the shot by not getting the shot, and maybe you will or won't get COVID. I've had all of it. I've had um, three of the shots and I've had COVID and I haven't had any ill effects. 
And honestly, when I had COVID, I thought, okay, now why am I experiencing this? And I thought I wouldn't get sick because I wasn't afraid. And what happened was, is I had a beautiful week off of work during gorgeous um, wet weather in August. We had a beautiful week and I was tired. I was sick. I, I got every symptom. Each day was a different symptom. And I just worked through it. And I learned to sit in the rocking chair on my deck. And that's when I intensely started stargazing. And that's when I really started going within and saying, okay, body, do what you need to do. But I want to be at peace. I want to be at peace with this virus. I want to be at peace with all the controversy around everything to do with it. And the, the voice said, there is no controversy. It's all just your body. Does it matter whether you drink purified water or well water? Does it matter whether you eat a vegetarian diet or a meat diet? It's what brings you the most inner peace and least amount of conflict. And you can't judge anything in this world because it's all illusion. You're all making this up and it'll be for you what you intend it to be. And I think it, it all and I flew through my my illness without any long term effects or anything like that. And yes, so um, it's just another lesson in letting go of conflict in a nutshell. The short version is it's another um, presentation and a last ditch effort from darkness, not that it's real, but there there are opposing factions and and the ego it's a last ditch effort of the ego to keep us from moving forward for as long as it can. Let me give you this big ordeal. And you know what? Let's have a bunch of big storms and let's have a war. Let's have all the things that are scary and just see how long we can keep humanity in fear. And Martha's saying, push through the clouds, just like the course says, you have to push through that and say, even though I see all this happening around me, I'm not gonna be afraid and I'm not gonna increase conflict by taking sides and saying someone else is wrong and I'm right. It's just an experience we're having together right. and try and do that with as much dignity, grace, and peace as you can. And I you'll move through it. experience, by the way, with COVID, you know, I was 24 days in hospital in isolation mm -hmm. and it turned out to be a beautiful mystical experience time for me because it was no, no computer. The mm -hmm. only thing I met with him is a cell phone with a course of miracles on it. But there was this stopping and this going within. That yes. I was, you know, I'm just busy all the time, you know. Me too. But <laughs> there was no busyness, you know. There was yes. just being, which mm -hmm. was turned out to a very positive experience. Here too. So I think we want to go now to uh, <clears throat> beginning to see if buds or anything. What else do you want to share from the? Your... Yeah, there's one more. So <laughs> there's a little bit of confusion on the multi-dimensional aspect of Martha. Mm -hmm. uh, does she live in three dimensions at once or does, is she just able to move into the different dimensions? What is that? So, What's going on there? It is very hard to understand that she is both a physical and non-physical being. So um, you are able to astrally move out of your body um, and become non-physical once you get to that point of spiritual evolvement. Um, so she is in a physical body on her world, but she said, if I went to visit her right now on, in my body, if somehow I was able to teleport myself, she said, you wouldn't see anything because you're not in the same dimension of reality. And I was reminded by her of in the course where it says how much more you'll see once you have forgiven this world, there's so much more you can't see. And it's not that she's physically far away. It's just a different vibration um and and her people we're in the third dimension and she's in the ninth through 12th depending on who you are in her um society because they have a mixture of those last three dimensions because everybody's you know you're almost there um so it is difficult to understand that there are realities within realities and it's also perfectly orchestrated and organized and that as we raise our consciousness to be able to expand, to um, encompass these ideas, we elevate naturally and we'll be able to see more and more of those other realities, those other worlds. And technically it's all non-physical because it's an illusion. <laughs> and at some point we, we 
we pass out of that and then that we move into uncharted territory we don't know I, Martha just assures there's so much more to keep experiencing and learning beyond the physical um, so you cannot get to her world with a spaceship or a satellite it is <laughs> you go through it she she d described it as like rings within rings you move towards the center and we're on an outer ring and you move towards the center of reality and it it's not a place you can take a physical object right and yeah. and the third question is could you talk a little bit about the painting that's behind you oh yes um this was done by one of my uh customers he was a patient of ours at my pharmacy who was had terminal cancer and um his name was paul clogus and he has since passed away and he was he lived a rough life until he got cancer and then his life transformed um, and he started seeing angels and they would communicate with him. So he started making these paintings because this is what he would see like in his room or in his mind's eye or physically both in and outside of his, his mind. Um, and so he paints angels or painted angels. And before he passed away, I, I made sure to get a few of his paintings because he lived right in the town where I worked and he'd have, you know, painting exhibitions and stuff. And um, so, yeah, it was just something really uh, precious. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Bud, or shall we go to... No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> well, let's go to Marsha. You want to ask a question? Yeah. Do we have to go through every density from this after... No. Oh, good. Oh, no. Um, in fact, the more you do here at the lowest density, it's a, like leapfrog because the course I feel like, and I felt this when I really started getting the course, I, I said to the Holy spirit, I feel like I'm cheating and bypassing because I'm learning as <laughs> you just gave us the answers. <laughs> so having to take a test in here, it's all B, C, A, B. Um, and, and so we're going to bypass, and that is what the other extraterrestrials don't get to do because their planets are not like this. They're so much more gentler and easier, but the pace is slower at learning because you don't have these very harsh things in your face, like uh, war and murder and rape and, and all these things that like, oh, how do you look past what some people on the planet are doing and not judge them and remember they're Oh, that's an aspect of my own mind. I, I want to heal this gap and heal this pain by realizing it's part of myself. And, and um, when you do that, you, you, you get to bypass hurting your hip on a, on a mountain. You get to <laughs> bypass uh, having any more return lives into a hard physical existence that is, is sort of the school of tough knocks. And yeah, you can leapfrog. Um, right into grander vistas than you can imagine. Yes. So we could uh, like leapfrog right into awakening into God. Yes. And like uh, let go of all resistance and there'll be no resistance <laughs> and you'll go right into that. But God will, I promise you'll have some work for you because you'll yearn to help <laughs> others. We never lose that yearning to want to go back and help others. And, okay. and it'll be magnificent. It's like, the most satisfying work you can ever do helping God, <laughs> you know, from okay. the point, point of view. That's what we're Thank all here you. for, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, I, I just have to thank both you and John for uh, uh, the fabulous expansion is that from the course, I've been able to jump out to all kinds of things. That being said, you both would have been branded as heretics as John and you as a witch in Salem for, for your, your things going on. So you're very fortuitous to be in this particular fifth uh, 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 evolution of the sun or whatever, however you, people call it. And, and that, that also being said, um, I, um, uh, it's not just being able for a, a lot of the people that still might have sort of a doubt about being able to talk to people from an, uh, extraplanetary things. And you were gifted with that thing as at an early age. But I just finished a five-day course called the Evolutionary uh, Plant Healing Summit uh, from the Shift Network. And from that, I, I've, I've found and I've, I've rediscovered 
that indigenous peoples and everybody else, they've been able to talk to plants and plants mm -hmm. have been talking to us for uh, before mammals walk the earth. I mean, they, they mm -hmm. created oxygen. They did all that stuff. And, and that, that uh, 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 sometimes we can actually be able to talk and, and uh, 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 the 60 some odd speakers in that they, they have people talking to lavender plants now that they, they, they make music and, 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 and uh, they, 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 it was just a fabulous conference that you as, as a um, pharmacist, uh, I think that there, the, the mycelium revolution, the health stuff, all these things going on um, as a, as a pharmacist, I think that the, the, we, we, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Hippocratic Oath said that, you know, uh, do no harm. But then it also said, don't treat the disease, treat the person with the disease. And so the whole thing. So that all being said, you are so wonderful. And I, I have only one question to you. What is this fabulous husband that you have that can tolerate all this stuff that, from you? <laughs> I know, yeah. He, um, he is a very mechanical minded, um, um, very, uh, his, his thinking is, is all very analytical and he doesn't do any of this stuff, but I tell him all of it and he still understands it. Like he still gets it and, and listens to it all and we can talk about it, but he himself, um, he just, he, but he somehow always makes choices and he'll come out with things that he says. And I tease him that he is the most spiritual person I know, most deeply spiritual person I know who doesn't know it. He has no idea that yeah. he's actually- I, 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 one, one, final, <laughs> one final comment is that you, you remind me so much of Dolly Parton and her oh. husband for 58 oh. years has not even uh, gone into the stuff or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, Jolene, Jolene was when Jolene tried to steal him from her. And, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that uh, sometimes uh, the, the feminist forces in us are much more uh, the patrilineal stuff uh, uh, falls by the wayside. And, and, and uh, you know, more power to your wonderful husband for for allowing <laughs> allowing you to do. <laughs> He's very tolerant. <laughs> By the way, when I when I first met Paul in uh, nineteen, didn't he have hit something with his arm or something? Oh yes. Yeah, so while I was at our conference yeah. at, in Miracles in the Mountains, he brought his mountain bike along, and he was going to go ride the trails because he's right. an avid mountain biker. And he had an accident and dislocated his collarbone. Right. And I was waiting uh, for the next speaker, and he calls me and he says, "I'm in the ER." And he said, <laughs> "I think I broke my collarbone." He didn't. He dislocated. He goes, and he said, "Can you come get me?" And I said. I don't, you took the car. <laughs> he said, how do I get you? You took the car to go drive to the trailhead. He goes, well, can you call a cab or something? I said, I can look into it. And I said, can you give me an address to send it to? And he goes, you know what? Hang on, hang on. He called me back and he said, when he had his accident, two guys were behind him. They helped him back to the trailhead. He was actually coming back to the trailhead and they helped uh, one carried him across his shoulder and the other pushed his bike. They loaded it up into their truck and brought him to the ER and they were still there. And they're like, well, why would we leave you? We knew you needed a ride back to wherever you came from. They okay. brought him back to the conference and like, see, everything worked out perfect. All right. All right. Let's go to Lynn and Jean. Lynn? Mighty companions. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, you, you, I, I love, I love listening to you, Beth. You, um, you had touched on uh, not all is good, mm. and and I, I, you know, I said Holy Spirit, and a Holy Spirit said it's it's different vibrations. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, I'd like to hear you, please. You so, think? um. There, so in my mind, I just assumed everything beyond planet Earth is innocent and pure and has nothing but good intentions for us because I couldn't conceive of that anything, um, you know, higher beings would be terrible or bad. Um, there are some who had malignant intent for planet Earth, and this is where we learned 
about fighting and war and planet Earth got off track. Most planets have a set regimen of their schedule of enlightenment and spiritual progress as the life takes life on the planet and evolves. They're, they're helped along in a very scripted way and it's very procedural and it goes along according to plan. But from what I understand, every 10th planet, you're allowed some creativity. And this is where you're allowed to make some mistakes and it's a free will planet. Not that you have not free will on other planets, but this has 100%. Um, if you're going to do, do anything, you can do it here. And so not all of our guidance, as we know, is, has been positive, um, even on our own planet among humans. There are people who are spreading uh, things that bring people down, you know, lies and untruths and things that increase fear rather than decrease fear or mm -hmm corporations who willingly deceive and take our money and things like that. All of that is shifting. It's coming to a head and the bad is getting worse than ever. And the good is getting stronger than ever. And there is this shift coming where either um, um, you got to get with the program or you're going to find yourself in another dimension where you're going to be left in that vibration and the new earth you just, it's not like there's any exclusion. Everyone is, in, is included in God's love, but your experience is going to be dependent on what you vibrate with. And this is where the shift comes out of forever, that, um, that conflict, that pain and suffering, and we're shifting into a higher vibration. I, I've seen things online and things that talk about the fifth dimension and I have no idea if those are right or wrong, but I do know we're moving towards something very positive and you definitely want to be on the, the leading edge of that wave as a human being, just putting out your love and light to, to ride that with the rest of humanity, because uh, it, it hasn't been all, you know, roses and, and rainbows in our earth's history. And we know that from our own experience in our own daily lives. And so any regressive otherworldly um, races, and there aren't many, and they typically aren't able to even leave their planet because they're closely watched. And if you don't have the spirituality, basically, if you don't have the responsibility or maturity to have the car keys, you're not going to get them. <laughs> you don't get to leave the house with the car if you can't handle it. And, and, uh, that is all being taken care of as we shift away from darkness and into the light. And I do believe the course came to this planet through Helen to help us make this shift because I don't think we could have done it without the course. No. Getting such a, a tipping point of minds in alignment with light and love. Like I, none of us would be where we are today with spirituality if it wasn't for the message of the course itself. And like John says, the message is surrounding it. Right. Blakesley and, and um, um, course of love. And yeah. Let's go on to Jane. Jane. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. Hi, great. Jean. Okay. Nice to meet Hi, you. Nice to yes. Hi. Jean um, writes to me from time to time and has wonderful, supportive, kind words. <laughs> Well, yeah, I just want to say, um, well, firstly, I thank you for everything that you're doing for, for the Sonship. It's just tremendous. I got so much out of your first book and I, I have your second book and I've, I've read through most of it. I haven't read about the sandbox yet, the mm -hmm. analogy, but um, I've gotten through an awful lot of it. Um, but I want to say, like even today, I think something, everything has been so amazingly helpful. Um, but I, I think where I have been recently, sup what has some of the forgiveness um, opportunities that appear, that have appeared the most challenging is how to forgive the body, bodily things. Mm -hmm. And that's where I feel some of the things that you have shared in the first book and in this and and in this most recent book as well as what you've said again today is just so it's just so helpful so so comforting so reassuring and you know how when you hear true when you read when you hear something that's true you just really resonate with it mm -hmm. and that's like when 
you know, so it's, it is a paradox when we say, well, it is all, you know, like, remember, it's all illusion. It's what you make it, you know, what you want it to be. And so, and that, so even, so I do find myself, because I'm still navigating this territory, I still find myself vacillating between, okay, well, I've decided that this is what's true for me today, you know, you know, like, I'm, I'm going to take vitamins and not feel bad about it or, you know, or, or I'm going to, or, or I'm not, I don't need that because, you know, I'm an infinite being. And, you know, so like, I'm still like, I'm like playing with the training wheels or something. So anyway, it's, it's, you know, navigating it from day to day, but I just want to say everything that you share is just so, um, it's so spot on. It's just so, it so rings of truth. And I just, I just want to thank you. And you're just so helpful to so many. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Doug Carroll. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I was um, so pleased to get your book, Beth, and to hear you the last time you were on. And the um you app you totally resonate and you brought um you know feelings that um we had had you know of where we feel alone mm -hmm. and um because we were literally when when you just now talked about um um you know the earth moving you know ascending and the vibration and the people that and then there'll be there could be people that won't um, we were recruited specifically to go with the people that don't. And um, <laughs> we've known this since 2003. Mm -hmm. And um, we took, obviously, we took the assignment very seriously to incarnate here. Mm -hmm. And um, and that this was a point when um, in this life, they told us, um, and how would you like to have children? And of course, we had purposely chosen not to have children in this life. And, mm -hmm. um, and we said, um, uh, sure, we do whatever you want, you know. <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm a little old. <laughs> and they said, it doesn't matter. We've done this before. <laughs> mm -hmm. OK. And, um, and so they, then they said, and they tell us who the children are going to be, you know. And um, they're. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're bringing our, we're bringing, we're archangels and we're bringing archangels in. And, um, and we're not the only ones. There's um, another, was it 12 groups or something that are doing this throughout the world? Yeah. I mean, this has been a while. It's been almost 20 years since they first told us. And so um, uh, we don't see our, you know, our, but we have, you know, obviously quite the communication with them. And, um, and we wrote a book about it. It was called um, The Earth. Um, the Last Thousand Years. Of the Earth Experiment. Experiment. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And it's where, in fact, um, it's where the, the idea of, of the, all this, you know, nobody's left behind. And right, the, right. And, and the concentration of they load the planet up with as, as much spirituality as they can because mm -hmm. there's all this low vibration mm -hmm. there. And um, and so after, you know, it takes a few years, but um, it starts to turn. And mm -hmm. um, but it's it's basically a thousand year. So, thing. Carol, I'm, I'm sorry. Is there a question? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, that was just it. That was, that was my question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to speak to the nobody is left behind, it sounds like there will be left behind people because of the lower vibrations, but they're not. They're not, yeah. The way it was explained to me is that, well, a kindergartner can't go to school with a 12th grader, you know? So at some point, there's a, a division of experience based on what you're willing to learn or where you're at. So if you're still learning darkness and haven't embraced or shifted to light yet, you're going to have to stay in that learning field till you get it, till you choose something else. And there's the right. whole choice factor. You can choose at any second, any second. 
to, to be a part of a higher vibration. And that's why with every thought in the course, the course talks about with every thought and every moment, we are always deciding right. where, who we're going to listen to and the ego or the Holy spirit. So it isn't a matter of anybody's being punished or purposely left behind. It's just that we will leave that experience and move into a different reality with a higher vibration that more matches our thoughts of love and light. And yeah, just to speak to that a little bit, that no one's actually being left behind. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, let's go with Lisa. You. Lisa, you want to share? I just have an, op an observation and I don't know, I know we're running out of time. Should I go ahead? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Sorry. Um, in the last couple of, um, with um, uh, Sebastian Blakely and, and this one, I've been thinking about the progression of, of my spirituality. And I think maybe this is true for a lot of other people is, you know, I heard about the fact that we are all one way back years ago and love and light and how strong that energy is, you know, and all of that stuff. And, and then came the Course in Miracles. And boy, it was a pivotal point for me. Everything that's come after, I see like a progression, you know, like the mind training you do in A Course in Miracles has helped me now to understand all that went before that I didn't understand. I mean, the level at which I understand it now has been so changed by the Course in Miracles. And um, I want to thank you. I loved, uh, John put a little bit of your, uh, a quote, couple of quotes from you in his uh, Miracles magazine. And mm -hmm. the one thing that really delighted me was how happy the Holy Spirit was to have been consulted. You know, oh it was God. like so excited to have you ask this question, you know, and I'm really glad I was here to hear you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank that you. reminds me of the uh, last issue of Miracles Magazine had a quote on the back from Beth about uh, not going into fear. And one of our subscribers, an older lady, sent me a really nice thing, note saying that she was really feeling down and depressed. And when she read this, it lifted her spirits very nicely. So thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we're, we're really at the, near the end of our time. I think it's okay if we run over a, a little bit, but... Uh, Beth, I feel like we just opened the door. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's so much more inside. Mm -hmm. I guess the next step is for the folks to read your book, and, and that's going to be a, a right. A, and a the book way. has has so much more in it uh, that we didn't even touch on about. Oh, you know, I yes, and then the final chapter where um, I would actually astrally traveled to Martha's planet and then was told that uh, you weren't supposed to do this. Like <laughs> you weren't supposed to come. I kind of went on my own and ended up in the ocean. And it was just the most bizarre experience. And when it all unfolded, I went, oh my gosh, I have to put this as a, you know, has to be in the book. And it was literally a few days away from being published and my poor publisher, Ronnie Whitson. And I said, I have to send you one more chapter. <laughs> this experience was too amazing. <laughs> I couldn't have made it up. And uh, yeah, just the fact that um, it's like, okay, now that was why every time I would ask Martha, when is it going to be published? She was just silent and just wouldn't say like, just be patient, be patient. And it, it was like more had to unfold. And I thought, but it's done. It's written. And, and no, it wasn't quite done yet. I had one more experience. And uh, so there's a lot packed in there and I'm sure there'll be questions and anybody can reach me on my website. Um, you can sign up for my monthly newsletter. I send an email out of my latest uh, things I've learned. And if anything new develops with Martha or anything, if I have a fairy encounter or an angelic encounter, um, I have a whole other avenue down that road that as those things happen, I share that on my website, on my blog, through my newsletter. So people know when stuff's posted. And I also have a YouTube channel where if you don't read or can't see well, or would rather listen to these things, I make everything into a YouTube video where I, I, I read what the blog says and um, you get to see nature scenes from my farm because that's what I use for the video feed is, nice. is uh, nature of my And school. the link to her YouTube site is in chat. Yes, yes. Well, thank you, Beth. I think we'll probably do a follow-up somewhere down the road. We got to try to keep up with you if we can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. 
But what's really exciting here is that there is a wonderful expansion in consciousness going on for all of us. And though there may be some storms in the future, there are bright clouds uh, going to disappear and mm -hmm. a light will come. It always does. There's always a sunshine after the storm. So that's yeah. what I think about. All right. And when those negative things happen or perceived negative things, whether they're global or personal in your body, in your relationships, or in our, our global situation, it's a last ditch effort of the ego because it's flailing and struggling in its death throes. And so that is, it's just like the, I have it right here too, the back cover of your miracles magazine rejoice when you see these things happening, because it's a sign that the, the darkness is, is, is struggling. It can't maintain yeah. it's, it's facade any longer. We're seeing through it and it's dissolving before our very eyes. It's yeah, just the old one I give away easily. No, and it, but it will be transcended it's not we fight against it there's no fight oh, against it no. not at all no. it's, just, uh, it, it's, a, it's aware of the fact that the fact that the course says it on the, the the ego suspects yes it, it yes. suspects it's suspicious that we're your motive. you know it, it kind of knows that something is up mm -hmm. you no know, uh which means of course its own dissolution but uh, then how can you dissolve something that never existed in the first place mm -hmm. exactly that's how we awaken from the illusion, actually. So uh, thank you all for, for being here. Really appreciate it. And thank you. Uh, if you can join next Sunday, uh, if you can't get the connection through Peer Presence, let me know about it and I'll try to make the connection for you. And uh, Aaron Apke is coming back on with me in November. And just stay tuned, as we might say. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. We always close with. And it's really interesting, the, uh, the Lord's Prayer from the Course of Miracles. There you uh, go. I'm thinking about this a lot lately and kind of singing it as just unconsciously as I'm driving the car, which is a good thing to do. If, if it, I, I recommend everybody memorize this and take it in. At some point in one of the classes, I want to go through a real kind of careful bit phrase by phrase analysis of what this says. So I'll just share it. Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander in temp to temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let's receive only what you have given and accept but this into the mind which you created and which you love. Amen. Amen. So let's go back into uh, our review and uh, uh, have our, our goodbyes. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you guys for that wonderful Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you everybody. Yeah, thank you. Bye.
Thank you all for being here. Thank you guys for that wonderful Thank message. You. Bye, Thank all. You. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. That Thank was you. wonderful. Thank you. Uh, good seeing you, bro. Thank Great you. to see everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Beth. Thank Have you. a glorious day. You too. It was yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Aloha. Hello. Hi, Kathy. I see you, Kathy. Yeah, I see you. <laughs> I Thank you. you. I see you. So, Avatar fans, eh? Yeah, right? <laughs> I see you. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Go ahead. Oh, I think you just disappeared. All right. All right. Uh, Marsha. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna Bye. go then. Is that right? <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Thank you so much. All righty. Oh, Scott Perry was with us. That's nice. She was the one who was responsible for getting together in color. Here's a go. All righty, guys. Oh. Kathy, are you there? Kathy Scott Perry, are you there? Yes. No. <laughs> oh, yeah, she is. Yeah, we want to thank you for putting that mountain thing together. That's where we all met, you know? Yeah, I know that. <laughs> and, and if it weren't for that, we wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gotten to know Beth personally. So That's that was really great. a meeting time for so many of us. Thank you for doing that. Well, thank you for having the vision to, uh, to really understand and love these people and get these people on your program and get their information out. It's important. Yeah, you're right, it is. Well, it feels natural. It just feels like uh, the thing to do. Keep in mind, I used to do church every Sunday morning. This, yeah. <laughs> this is a new dimension of church. <laughs> We're going to go Easier. further. <laughs> All right. All right, folks. Bud, thanks for your help. Always. All right. See you later. So grateful. Bye, hon. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.